I didn't notice you with your hair. Well, good morning, Mattituck Presbyterian Church. Good morning. Welcome to worship. A couple of our college kids are home. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mom and dad are just a glow. Like a week, not even a week, like two or three days after you guys, like I saw them and they were kind of like, hmm. Yeah, so they're just delighted that you're back. We're back, of course, to a mask mandate, which we hope will be lifted on January 15th. If you need one, um, just raise your hand. We've got extras in the back. Christmas Eve services are at 4, 7, and 11. 4 p.m. is the family-friendly, um, more contemporary, and 7 and the 11 are the traditional with choir. All of them are going to be candlelight services, so we're excited. Uh, December 26, we're going to have one service at 10 a.m. That's going to be a hymn sing, so come. If you want to sing hymns the day after Christmas, we'd love for you to join us. We have an exciting announcement we'd love for you to keep an eye out for um, in the weeks leading into mid-January. We're going to start a soup kitchen that's going to meet on Sunday afternoons just for the winter months, January, February, and March. We know that a lot of folks in those months have food insecurity. Many people are laid off kind of early December, and they aren't hired again until April. We're going to call this soup kitchen the Winter Table. It's a place for people to come Sunday afternoon, good hearty soup and bread. Um, if you'd like to volunteer for that, we certainly need volunteers. But the Winter Table, we're very excited about that. I want to invite Peggy Brodus up for a moment for mission. Good morning. Christmas Eve, we will be celebrating the Christmas Joy offering. As stated in your bulletin, 50% of your gifts support current and retired church workers and their families, and 50% make it possible for students to learn and grow in faith at Presbyterian-related schools. For those of you who know me, you know that my mother lived with me from 1989 to 2006 when she passed away at 94. She was a wonderful person and I miss her. This church was very kind to her with all the support, visits, and caroling. She considered the church a second family. My mother had an enlarged heart and other medical conditions. I was taking her to the doctor every few months or once a month. We would go on a doctor's visit and the next thing I would be taking her into the emergency room. She would be admitted for a few days, I would go and get her, and she would feel great. We often kidded around that every time she went to the hospital, it was like she was going in for an oil change. Meantime, I have my daughter, who is a senior. We had to find a college for her to go to. We had gone on a college-seeking trip up north to Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, staying over in a hotel and getting up and looking at campuses. It was stressful because this was before navigation systems, Google Maps, GPS, and Waze app. You had to actually print out your directions and you had to bring maps. Jessica was great. She could read a map and was good in directing me where to turn. However, the trip didn't find us a college for her that she liked. To top the stress factor here, my daughter was also on the Manitouk Varsity softball team. We had games and practices, and that was all good. Her softball team wound up being the New York State Class C Final Four. They were state regional champions, Long Island champions, Suffolk County champions, undefeated League Eight champions, and Jessica was on Newsday's All Long Island softball team two years in a row. Jessica was the shortstop of the team. She was all league, all division, and all county. We were going to go look at colleges again, but this time we were going south. Now time is running out. I'm really getting nervous and starting to feel overwhelmed. My mother isn't feeling good. My mother has a doctor's appointment that Friday. We go on the appointment and the next thing I know, I'm in the emergency triage center of Stony Brook Hospital. Here I am sitting by mother, my mother's side as they are connecting her up to monitors, talking to the doctor, and I'm saying to myself, there's no way Jessica and I are going anywhere this weekend. 
I remember looking up from my mother into those bright lights they have in hospital rooms and saying, dear God, you have to help me with this. You have to help me find a college for my daughter. About a week or so later, we get a phone call from Manhattan College who wants to come and have Jessica try out for the, for the Manhattan College Division I girls softball team. She tries out, she makes it, and gets a scholarship. She went to Manhattan College and graduated in 2007 with her future husband. God had answered all my prayers and then some. Your gifts to the Christmas Joy Offering answer so many similar prayers. As you can read in your bulletin, Sarah was able to pursue a safer life and a good education at the Presbyterian Pan American School in Kingsville, Texas. Sarah is now a pre-med student and her sister is a Houston-based architect. As stated from Ray Roberts, a graduate of Stillman College, I think a lot of people may not realize how many lives they can affect just by their support. It's a simple fact when you give students a scholarship, especially those students who are really in need, it's the best thing that could happen to them. It changes their lives. I saw how it changed my daughter's life. May we continue to answer people's prayers and change people's lives through our gifts to the Christmas joy offering. For all of you that have teens about to go to college, do yourself a favor and start looking early. I'm wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and may God bless. And I have one more thing to say. The envelopes for the um, Christmas joy offering are out on the narthex, and I have Lynn that needs to explain something here also. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I have a special announcement this morning. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor James if he would come join me, and also Tara, if you would come up as well. <coughs> Our church has been so blessed this year. <laughs> Our church has been so blessed this year by the arrival of the QB family, and um, it's been a long past few years for us as a church family. <laughs> Sorry. And we so appreciate God's blessing on our church and um, especially the blessing of the QBs coming to uh, lead us this year. So it's my great pleasure on behalf of our congregation to present them with a Christmas gift. <laughs> I'm just as happy, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's worship God together. <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, Psalm 113 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. I would like to ask the Williams family to come up, please, for the lighting of the candle.
scripture for candle lighting, Micah 5, 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from, from me. Who is? One who will be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock, yin, the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, of the Lord is God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Amen. Please stand if you are able this morning for our time of worship and praise. Our first song is Hymn of the Ages. The words will be up on the screen. How great you are. How great must be your song. Here we go. Sing your praises. To sing your praises with a thousand tongues. It's the purpose of my day. The purpose in my days is ever to proclaim how great you are. How great must be your song. You're the hymn of the ages, the hope of all the world. You carry out. Jesus, Lord of Lords, 
Father, we thank you this morning, <coughs> and we give our lives to you as an offering. The Bible says that we are to come and give our lives as an offering of thanksgiving and an offering of praise to the Lord. So I encourage you this morning to offer your life to Christ, even if you've done it 10,000 times, do it again. Say, Jesus, take everything. I come this morning, Lord, and I offer myself to you because you came as a child and offered yourself for us. And what can we do in return, Lord? What can we do in response but to give our lives, our hearts, our minds, our everything to you? And we do that this morning, Lord Jesus, gladly. We lift you up in glad praise and worship, and we thank you, Lord. We praise you. Hallelujah.
Please take a minute and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Remember Carla, right? Carla. That was nice, right? Yeah, that was gorgeous. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks, Lord. Lord. Thank you. Pray for him. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Well, I'd like to invite the children forward for the time with children. We've got a children's message. I got to kind of do it from back here. It's going to be a little weird. That's okay. guys see me all the way over here 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 I got I got to do it from here it's a little strange but them's the breaks um do you know somebody who is very different from you they like something very different they like a bunch of things very different from you do you know somebody like that have a friend like yeah you've got one like that anybody else what's that Yes. So when I went to college, I had a roommate named Jack, and he and I were very, very different. He loved DC Comics. I love Marvel. Okay. I played soccer. He didn't do a whole lot of anything. He loved to party hard. Mom and Dad will explain that later. I was not a big partier. And we did not get along for the first few months of college because we were living together in this room. We did not get along. We were very different. But over time, became more and more patient. I learned more and more about Jack. He was, continued to be different, 
but he ended up being one of the groomsmen at my wedding. We became good friends. So even if you've got somebody you know who's very different from you, I encourage you to be patient, love them. You don't have to become like them, but you can become friends over time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for people who are very different from us. Thank you for the opportunity to grow, to become more like you, and patiently over time to become even friends. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Miss Tara and Miss Lynn are going to take you up to Sunday school. <laughs> I've never seen that, Grant. That's great. Okay. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you with so much on our hearts and minds. There's so many things still to be done. We're not sure that we can do them all. But we have come here this morning to you, to hear you, to know more about you to love you well and to be sent out into the world filled with your spirit. That's what we desire this morning. That's what we ask for. Father, we come with people, places, situations on our hearts and mind, especially this morning, Lord, we lift up Carla, who is in the ICU. Gracious God, be with her, bless her, and strengthen her. Bring her healing, Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to your mercy. And now, in silence, we lift, up to the, we lift up to you, Lord, those who are on our hearts and minds. <coughs> Father, bless all these people, we pray. Lord, bring healing, bring reconciliation, bring new life. Bring them, Lord, to a knowledge of you as Lord and Savior. Gracious God, in this season of darkness, we pray for light, your light which is shown into the world which cannot be put out. And so, Lord, if you must, light that flame in our hearts again. And if it is lit, Lord, fan it into flame. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Let us now return to God our tithes and our offerings. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to set in poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they keep.
Father, bless these gifts to your use, us to your loving and faithful service. Keep us ever mindful of those in need and all those who are near and dear to us. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Seb, thank you so much. It was amazing. How did Jesus, how did he meet all the people that he met? It seems like when we look at the Gospels, there are at least four or five different ways that he met with and engaged people who were very different from him. Met settings a lot like this, where there were maybe 100, maybe 70 or more. He would often, you know, feeding of the 5,000, or he'd speak to hundreds or thousands of people. Um, he'd also meet with smaller groups, 20 to 70. He sent the 70 out to go and do work in his name, given power to do that. He worked with smaller groups, 12, the 12 disciples. And then he'd work with three or four people at a time, James, John, Peter. So that matches up with a lot of how we experience life together in worship, when we go out on mission in groups of 20 or even more, when our session or when our home groups meet, and then when smaller groups of people come together to pray or to do leadership development. We talked about all of these things a couple of weeks ago as we reconstituted our evangelism committee. We are kind of looking at the theory and the practice of what it means to reach out to people in the same way that Jesus Christ reached out to people during his earthly ministry. And as we looked at our life together, we saw that there was a lot to celebrate. There were a lot of things that we did that match up with how Jesus did his ministry. So that's kind of the theory and the practice, the explanation and the execution of how you do it. But at the bottom of it, at the foundation, is the command for us to go and to love our neighbor as ourselves, our neighbor who sometimes is very different from us. How does that happen? Who is that person for you? Who's that person for you who's very different? It might be a friend, they might be a family member or an acquaintance. And what, what are the differences? Probably have someone in mind. Maybe it's you're an introvert, they're an extrovert. It can be, I think, kind of a miracle when we become friends with somebody like my roommate Jack that I spoke about just a moment ago, how does that happen? It requires some heart work, look at our own emotions, the way that we react to people who are different from us, and it also requires hard work. Today, we're finishing up our series, A Place for the King. We invite Jesus into our lives, into the lives of other people. Do we make room in our lives for Jesus our King. And today we're looking at what it means to find Jesus in the life of another person, someone who's very different from us. So we read from Matthew chapter 22, beginning at the 34th verse. It's on page 1007 in your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Matthew 22, beginning at the 34th verse. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of the Lord. In Richmond County, North Carolina, it's a small town called Ellerby. It has several things to recommend it. The world's largest strawberry-shaped building, a racetrack built for lawnmowers, can you imagine? It's also the final resting place of Andre the Giant. You guys know, yes, Danny knows Andre the Giant. If you grew up watching wrestling <laughs> from way back, Hulk Hogan, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Ricky the Steamboat Dragon. Yes, Danny knows. All right. Yeah. The Undertaker. That's right. Or maybe if you've seen the movie Princess Bride. Have you seen the movie Princess Bride? The really big Andre the Giant. 
The guy who climbs the mountains, he always talks to Vicini, who's always putting him down. He was seven foot four, about 500 pounds, shoe size 26, from France. He grew up in France, often called the eighth wonder of the world. He's a quiet man in real life. He spoke English with a thick French accent. So how did he end up in Ellerbee, North Carolina? A fellow wrestler who had a family in that county invited him to visit, invited him to a family meal. Come on, everybody here is easy going. You'll be just another person. Come have dinner with the family. Not long after, Andre bought a ranch off of uh, North Carolina Highway 73. He raised and kept longhorns. He finished each day, get this, in a recliner especially made for a 500-pound man. It's just awesome. But he did die at the age of 46, and his ashes were spread on that farm in North Carolina. Everywhere he went in his 46 years, he was stared at, gawked at, probably never felt completely at home, but when he went to Ellerby, he did. He felt at home, he felt like he was with family. I don't know for sure, but this is what I like to think accounted for Andre choosing Ellerby. I bet the people in Ellerby looked less like, less at the man and more at his heart. I bet when he visited with the family of his wrestling buddy, they had quite a spread. Can you imagine feeding two wrestlers? Just a lot of grace for a man who, even though he could be intimidating, probably felt judged most of his life. I bet the people he met in Ellerby had been shaped by generations of people who loved God and loved their neighbor as themselves, no matter what they looked like. They loved Andre like he was their own. Isn't that what we all want? It's what Jesus means when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever felt that? I, I know I and my family have since moving here from South Carolina. We were just immediately treated like, loved like we were family. God who includes all of us in his family by grace creates a people who do what Ellerby did for Andre. They say, come on. Come and be family with us. We'll work this out together. Let's look a little more closely at the text from Matthew. Understand what Jesus was up against and why he put those two things together. Love of God, love of neighbor. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and taking turns trying to trap Jesus. Remember, he's in the temple. It's time. It's the Pharisees' turn. They want to trap him in his own words, demonstrate their superiority. The Sadducees were... Again, they were kind of the make peace guys. Make peace with Rome. Don't take religion so seriously. The Pharisees were the zealots. Get Rome off our backs. Let's return to the true faith. In this episode, it's the Pharisees. They want to test Jesus' knowledge and interpretation of the law. Not only do you know it, you know the Ten Commandments, but do you interpret it like we do because we've got it right. Pharisees think they know what it means to love God and love people, but they're not expressing it. It's in their voice. It's kind of shrill, judgmental. It just doesn't seem loving. Jesus, in his response to the Pharisees, he does something simple and profound. He simply quotes scripture from Deuteronomy about loving God and Leviticus about loving our neighbor. He puts those two together. Simple quotation. He knows it by heart. He can bring it to bear when he's under pressure. And here's the profound thing. He connected them. He said, these two things, love of God, love of neighbor, they go together like sun and sunshine, like a hug and the great feeling you have after a hug. I miss that. I just, COVID is awful for huggers. Here's the big thing Jesus is saying too, in case we missed it. If you can't claim to love God, you can't do it. You're actively <laughs> hating your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor also, if you're not seeking out their welfare, and if they're very different from you, you can say it, you can say you love God, but it won't be true. If everyone looks, believes, speaks like you, you just love them, then, well, this is what Jesus says. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. 
Isn't that an important word for us in this season of life? This season of restarting church, where the temptation is to be, I just want to be with me and my own people. I want to be at home. I think it's important for a couple of reasons. It's a lot of strife, a lot of division, deep and bitter disagreement. And it shows that there are many people who do not love God, love the neighbor. In fact, they're pretty sure God does not love their neighbor. But it's important for us for another reason. A lot of people are acting on this commandment. They're just not getting much of the news. They don't buy into the strife, the stridency, the hatred. There's so much good news that goes unreported every day. I know you see it, so celebrate it. So let me ask you to do a couple of things. Reach out. When I asked you at the beginning, who's that person for you who's very different? Reach out to that acquaintance, that friend. Don't talk politics. <laughs> Just check in and love on one another. Second, give thanks for, give prominence to the people you know whose stories you know about people doing the simple, the right, the good thing. Loving their neighbor like themselves. Loving their neighbor like they were family. It's very easy to tribe up in our world today, to find your people online or in your community who are just like you, who it costs nothing to love, to be friends with. But is that the way of Jesus Christ? Can we say we love God if we do not also love our neighbor, who's very different from us? Brings me to the last, but maybe the most important point about loving our very different neighbors. It's really not possible apart from grace. We can't just try harder and do it. I think we have to have a profound, deep understanding of grace in order to get there. The first commandment that Jesus spoke about in our scripture for today, it's where we find it. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul. Sometimes they add strength, all of it. Right? Apart from grace, we can't please God with even one small deed because we might be doing it from a motive of proving to my neighbor who's different from me, I really can show you the better way to love people. Grace puts us all on the same level. It says we're all sinful. We've all fallen short of the grace of God. So no one can stand above another person and say, see, let me show you a better way. Because Jesus Christ has come to us and said, I, I will show you a better way. I will make my place among you. I will fill you with my spirit, and I will lead you into the future. Jesus is not saying, love God, love neighbor. Go to church on Sunday, do something good every once in a while, and that fulfills that commandment. It's much more. It's calling for our entire lives, our entire lives. He wants us to be all in, but friends, we can't do it apart from grace. Let me finish with prayer this morning. Father, I pray this morning that if we've reached this moment, if we've reached this time of worship through hard work, through trying harder, through trying to be good, to please you, Lord, I pray that you would banish that thought today. Gracious God, you come to us in Jesus Christ. In a child born in Bethlehem, you come to show us, full of grace and truth, what grace is. Lord, you forgive us, even when we can't forgive ourselves, even when we think we are unforgivable, you forgive. You come to us, you bless us, you fill us with your spirit. And so, Lord, I pray for each person here if they know you to be filled afresh, if they do not know you, to be filled for the first time and to confess that you are their Lord and Savior. And I ask all these things in your name. Amen. We stand this morning for our final hymn of praise, which is Angels We Have Heard on High. 
The words will be up on the screen. seek out that neighbor who's very different from you. Reach out. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen.